welcome to the 32nd lecture in our particle characterization course. In the last few lectures, we have been examining methods of synthesizing nanoparticles as well as um, dispersing them uh, in suspensions as well as in composite materials and so on. Now, in order to, for us to be able to characterize these uh, nano processes and also to control and optimize them, it is very important that we have to be able to measure the relevant properties of these nanoparticles as well as their suspensions. So, in this lecture, we are going to focus on techniques that are particularly appropriate for characterizing nanoparticles. As we do so, we will also look at some important properties of nanoparticles, both from a, a functional viewpoint as well as from a material viewpoint. So, when we look at nanoparticle properties, they are not too dissimilar from the properties of particles that we had listed earlier when we started this course. There are the morphological properties, size and shape, structural properties. And then in terms of functional property enhancement, there is a, a, an emphasis on characterizing thermal properties, electromagnetic properties, optical properties and mechanical properties of nanoparticles because it is in these properties that they show particularly significant differences in their nano form compared to bulk form. What are some of the tools that are used to characterize nanoparticles? Well, we start with the simplest of them all, which is the low power microscope that I am sure you have all used in your laboratory. Um, you basically <coughs> look through an eyepiece and look at objects with uh, anywhere from 10x to 100x magnification depending on the uh, power of the microscope that you have. It is certainly a very useful tool and we have discussed uh, as we have discussed earlier in this course, it is a starting point to most analysis. You really cannot jump from visual inspection to SEM or TEM because the, the difference is just too large. An optical microscope is an intermediate tool that is used to provide some additional magnification beyond what you can just get with your naked eyes. But at the same time, the magnification is low enough that you can sample a fairly large surface area uh, without wasting too much time on it. So it is a good pre-screening methodology before you decide what more sophisticated analytical instrumentation you are going to employ. Uh, we have discussed optical microscopy earlier in our lectures, but just to recap the key points. It is a, a simple method, low cost, it is widely used for routine analysis, magnification less than 50 times. However, there are analytical microscopes that are available that can provide up to 1000x magnification. The sample is examined initially at a low magnification, 5 to 7x, and then the magnification is gradually increased until you get a better understanding of what you are looking at. The sample or illumination, the lighting that you provide is manipulated to aid in the understanding. So for example, you can assess whether the surface or particle is reflective, how uniform is it, what is its shape, what are the surface features that are predominant. With an optical microscope, you can certainly see objects as small as 50 microns or even 1 to 2 microns. However, the resolution is poor and that is the reason why we need to go to uh, electron microscopy. Again, as we have discussed earlier, there is bright field microscopy, dark field microscopy and UV microscopy. In bright, fi bright field, you illuminate the entire field of view and you particularly examine the contrast between the specimen and the holder. In dark field microscopy, you use a dark background and you allow the particles to be highlighted as bright spots. In UV microscopy, you eliminate the specimen within, with UV wavelength and this is particularly useful in detecting particles and uh, materials that fluoresce. Now the low power light microscopy is not an end to itself. For most purposes, particularly in the nano regime, it is only the starting point. It allows you to decide what type of additional analysis is needed. As we have seen before, one of the first classifications you have to do is, is it a metallic or a non-metallic substance? Is it an organic or inorganic substance? 
these types of decisions then allow you to use appropriate instrumentation for doing more in depth analysis. The scanning electron microscope as we have seen earlier is a huge advancement over optical microscopy. Here the sample is being irradiated with an electron beam and the electrons that are being emitted scatter electrons from the sample that is under analysis and by looking at the scattered electrons by gathering them and subject, subjecting them to appropriate analysis, we can get an idea about the topography of the surface as well as the elemental composition of the material. Um, as we have seen before, you can do x-ray microscopy to get analysis regarding particularly the composition of the material uh, and OJ analysis which enables you to knock off particles at various layers of the particle or surface and therefore enables you to do depth profiling. And by the way, in this figure you would notice that uh, there is a mislabeling. X-rays do not provide depth, depth analysis, they primarily provide compositional analysis. OJ electrons really provide your depth analysis. Now looking at scanning electron microscopy in a little more detail, again you take a focused beam of electrons and you run it over the surface of the object. Electrons are scattered or emitted from the surface of the object collected by a detector and the intensity of the emissions or scattering allows us to image it on, on a cathode ray tube and this produces images that have very high depth of focus. The primary advantage of a scanning electron microscope is the depth of focus compared to light microscopy. Um, SEM can provide shape analysis, size analysis, texture and when you combine it with the energy dispersive x-ray analysis or wavelength dispersive spectroscopy, it also provides elemental composition information. OG analysis provides depth profiling and of course uh, tunneling electron microscopy as we have seen improves resolution by an order of magnitude compared to scanning electron microscopy. The atomic force microscope is again an instrument that we have dealt with in some detail earlier in our lectures in the context of particle characterization in general. It is especially suited to analysis of nanoparticles because of its ability to manipulate as well as see matter at nanoscale or even sub nanoscale. Um, again what this consists of is a probe that rides very, very close to the surface uh, with angstroms of separation between the surface and the probe. So it is very sensitive to intermolecular forces of attraction and repulsion and therefore can very sensitively detect changes in the morphology or composition of the substrate essentially by using a cantilever principle. The small deflection of the probe due to the induced force is magnified many times using a cantilever arrangement and therefore it enables us to um, identify and even quantify very, very small variations in surface topography in three dimensions. So an atomic force microscope is essentially a surface profiler very similar to a mechanical stylus that is used to gauge roughness of surfaces. And it, in fact it does consist of a small stylus that is moved up and down over a surface, two angstroms of separation between the probe and the surface. This enables us to achieve an atomic level interaction with the surface which is measured as the deflection of the cantilever beam um, using a laser that is reflected off the back of the cantilever. So essentially you traverse the sample under the stylus and uh, obtain 3D imaging of the surface with one angstrom sensitivity. As we have discussed in, in length that in the class, you can operate it either in contact mode or non-contact mode depending on how close you bring the probe to the surface. If you bring the probe within the um, attractive range of the intermolecular potential, then it is essentially is operating in a contact mode whereas if you locate the probe in the repulsive region of the intermolecular potential curve you are operating in a non-contact mode. Of course we have also discussed the intermittent contact mode where the probe periodically moves from the non-contact region to the contact region and each of these modes of operation has their own particular benefits as well as disadvantages for various types of analysis. But in general an atomic force microscope can detect particles, it can characterize grain sizes, measure surface roughness, 
and provide critical dimensions in 3D. XRD again we have discussed uh, in some detail in class. It is the primary method that is used to detect the crystallographic structure of a material and it operates by the principle of Bragg's law which enables us to um, measure interplanar distances in a crystalline structure by looking at scattering intensity. So in XRD what we are trying to do is determine the arrangement of atoms within a crystal. So a beam of X-ray strikes a crystal, diffracts into many directions. We measure the angles and intensities of the diffracted beams and therefore we produce a three-dimensional image of how the electrons are actually located within the crystal. And from that information, you can determine the mean positions of the atoms in the crystal as well as the, the structure of the bond, the chemical bonds, the disorder in the crystal lattice and so on. So XRD is a very powerful technique in terms of enabling us to peek into the crystallinity of the material. Now in terms of size analysis, we have seen several methods in this, in this course earlier. Essentially when we talk about size, what we are trying to do is represent even a three dimensional particle with a single dimensional scalar value. So for example, when we represent a particle by a diameter, that is what, what we are doing. We are assuming that the shape of the particle is roughly spherical and therefore you can use essentially a single dimension to represent the size of the particle. Size is represented in two ways uh, as absolute geometric values. So for example, you can take the size of a particle in three dimensions, call them length, width and, and the depth dimensions and you can do statistical averaging of these dimensions as well. And so through these geometric measurements, you can assess size. You can either do uh, again uh, a single dimensional value of, of the size or you can obtain a two dimensional representation of size and so on. And you can use statistics to the level that you want. You can either rely upon single measurements or you can measure the same particle at various angles and obtain mean values of L, W and D. Um, we have seen some examples of statistical size analysis earlier in this course such as Martin's diameter and Ferret's diameter and so on. So these are simple geometric representations of size. However, in many cases what we are interested in is not the absolute size of the particle but rather how it behaves in our process, the functional dimensions of the particle. In order to obtain the functional values of particle size, we typically use equivalent diameters. For example, when we use sieve analysis for size determination, the value that, that we are measuring is not the absolute size of the particle but the sieving diameter. It is essentially the diameter of a, a, a spherical particle which will be sieved with the same efficiency as a real particle that we are looking at. Similarly, light scattering diameter is essentially the diameter of a spherical particle which scatters light with the same intensity as the particle under question. Stokes diameter would be the diameter of a spherical particle that settles with the same velocity as the real particle that we are looking at and so on. And so equivalent sizes are not absolute sizes but they provide us with a relative measure which can be used very effectively in controlling or running specific processes. As long as we are clear in our understanding that particle sizes, size is never a unique value. It really depends on the method of measurement. And this is increasingly true as you approach the nano dimensions. The method of measurement itself determines the size that you measure. So for example, if you set the particle in diffusional motion and you measure it sized size based on its rate of diffusion that is called a Brownian diameter. Is it a true representation of the geometrical size of the particle? Not really. Again what we are measuring here is a size that represents its transport properties most closely. There are many methods of size measurement. We have reviewed several of them in the, earlier in this course. Laser diffraction based methods, differential mobility based methods, static light scattering and dynamic light scattering based methods. 
ultrasonic attenuation spectroscopy, focused beam techniques. And in fact, there are standards that have been set by the International Standards Organization, ISO, for size measurement, measurement of particles. There is a standard on size measurement by gravitational liquid sedimentation, um, method based on centrifugal liquid sedimentation, electrical sensing zone methods, laser diffraction methods, photon correlation spectroscopic methods, image analysis methods, and single particle light interaction methods. So of these standards, the first two, 13317 and 13318, are really not applicable to nanoparticles because they require particles to be quite large in order to be able to characterize them based on their settling characteristics. However, standards 19 to 23 do apply to nanoparticles, and we will review them in a little more detail in this lecture. Now laser diffraction, again, we have discussed quite extensively earlier in this course. It essentially takes a light source and impinges the light onto the sample, which causes the light to be scattered. And the scattered light is then collected through an arrangement of lenses and detectors. And the signal is analyzed. And through the use of calibration curves that relate, for example, <coughs> scattering intensity to the size of a particle, you can estimate the size of the particle based upon your measurements of scattered light. So in principle, laser diffraction is a method that works quite well for the size assessment of particles. But as we have seen earlier, when we go into the nano regime, because scattering intensity scales as particle size to the power 6, the scattering intensity is, is very feeble. And therefore, it is difficult to get a good signature of the particle by simply relying on laser diffraction. The principles of laser diffraction are that you have a light source, generate a monochromatic beam, uh, then you, take, you convert it to a, to a collimated beam, you eliminate the particles, the particles scatter light in a unique fashion. Every particle has a unique pattern or fingerprint of how, the, how it scatters light. The patterns are then Fourier transformed, and the photocurrent from the detectors is processed and digitized. And finally, you use computer software to convert the measured signal into a particle size distribution. The, again, the underlying assumption here is most particles of interest can be reasonably approximated through spheres. Therefore, theories that are appropriate for spherical particles can be used to determine size based on scattering intensity measurements. However, the size, again, the key point is that the size obtained from most particle sizing technologies, including laser diffraction, will differ from the real dimension of the particle. Again, the, the definition of what is real is actually open to debate. Um, the most real assessment of particle size is when you can actually immobilize it and, and look at it, for example, under a scanning electron microscope or a tunneling electron microscope, something that has sufficiently high magnification as well as high resolution in order for you to unequivocally determine what, is it, what are its actual dimensions. And even that may only work in 2D. The three-dimensional characterization of size is, is not possible even with the best SEM and TEM that we have. And we have to resort to techniques like AFM to obtain sizes in three dimensions. A differential mobility analyzer really uses the transport properties of the particle in order to characterize its size. So here, you would essentially take particles that are suspended in gas, for example, a, a polydispersed aerosol, which would then go into the mobility analyzer and here, the particles will essentially be classified or separated according to size by imposing an external field on it. And, and later on, as we have seen earlier, you can actually direct these particles into a condensation particle counter, which will condense material onto the particle and grow it to a sufficiently large size where it can be analyzed with a laser particle counter. So the operating principle of differential mobility analyzers is that 
you take the sample, mix it with air and introduce it into a chamber where you actually impose an external field on it. For example, you can impose an electrical charge on these particles. When you do that, again, the particles will move at different rates depending on their sizes. So, by looking at their mobility in the electrical field that is applied, you can separate the particles by size and later on you can then analyze them under a laser particle counter to do size assessment. Now, methods such as stat static and dynamic light scattering, commonly known as SLS and DLS methods, essentially still rely upon light scattering as the main technique for detection. But the way that they are differentiated is that in dynamic light scattering, what we are really looking at is scattering of light by particles that are dynamic in nature, that have sufficiently high velocities that even short term intensity fluctuations of scattered light that arise from the fact that the particles are moving around can be detected quite sensitively. So, you can essentially do time resolved measurements and you can locate particles at different instances of time and the distance that these particles have traveled between one light exposure to the next actually gives you indirectly uh, an estimate of particle size since that mobility is dictated by their size. So, these movements of particles are called Brownian motion and the when they are small enough the uh, motion is um, at sufficiently high velocities that they do cause measurable fluctuations in the intensity of the scattered light. On the other hand, in static light scattering, the presumption is that we are not looking at individual nanoparticles. What we are really trying to characterize are clusters of particles that have grown to a sufficiently large dimension that they are not very mobile, that they are essentially stationary and therefore, you can look at them for sufficient period of time without having to worry about their moving around to a significant extent. So, from the viewpoint of light scattering, you can assume that the particles are essentially fixed in place and apply measurement principles. Now, acoustic attenuation spectroscopy, again we have discussed in, in an earlier lecture in some detail. This is particularly suited to high concentration slurries. So, here instead of looking at light scattering as a an indicator of particle size, you look at the scattering of an acoustic field and you also use in this case a spectroscopic method. You cycle the acoustic field through various frequencies and you look at the associated spectra and you compare it with the mathematical model for how this, this acoustic field will be attenuated for a given distribution of particle sizes for a given material and then you match the model predictions to your actual observations to extract the prevailing particle size distribution. So, the way the acoustic attenuation spectroscopy method works, again it is primarily to measure the size distribution of colloids, dispersions, slurries, emulsions where the concentrations are expected to be fairly high and the frequency dependent attenuation or velocity of the ultrasound is measured as it passes through the sample. And these, the measured signal depends on the size distribution as well as the concentration of the dispersed material. And then you then obtain the particle size distribution and concentration by either using theoretical calculations or an empirical approach. If you do not want to set up the equations and solve them, then you can also, if you have known standards of known size, you can expose them to an acoustic field, measure the signals that you get and essentially develop your own calibration curve. But that approach only works when you are using the same material all the time. So, if there is any change in the, in the characteristics of the material or even if there is a substantial change in the size distribution of the sample, the empirical approach would not work and you are better off going to a more theoretical analysis which is more fundamentally based. The focused beam measurement technique is one that again is very similar to light scattering in the sense that you take an energy beam and you focus it on the particle. Now, the beam can be any light beam although it is typically a laser and 
here again you try to train the focal point on the particle and when the focal point of the light meets the particle you measure the reflected light and or the scattered light. Now one of the advantages of this technique is this beam is smaller than the particle dimension. So you can actually get some resolution of the particle uh, in terms of the distribution of its features. So you can actually train the beam at specific points on the particle and you can move the focal point along the particle and do characterization of the particle essentially by depth for example. Uh, the requirement of course is that the, the focal point of the beam must be smaller than the size of the particle for this technique to be really useful. Otherwise it becomes very similar to an SLS or DLS type of methodology. So the technique here measures a chord length which does not necessarily relate to diameter. I mean the difference between a chord and a diameter of course is that the diameter goes through the center of the particle and joins two opposite sides. However, it is possible to take the chord length and relate it to size and shape of the particle but it is a little difficult complicated and therefore frequently the chord length distribution itself is used as the data that characterizes size, shape and the concentration of particles in suspension. It is again an approximation obviously a chord length is not necessarily a representation of particle size but in a relative sense it can be used to compare sizes and shapes of various particles. The electrical sensing zone method also known as the Coulter principle is a little different from the techniques we have discussed so far in the sense that here the particles are actually immersed into an electrolyte solution and the change in conductivity is measured. So this is particularly well suited to non-conducting particles. So the principle here is to measure changes in electrical resistance that is produced by non-conductive particles that are suspended in an electrolyte. So what you have here is two electrodes and a small opening between them which is called the sensing zone. The suspended particles pass through this sensing zone and as it does they displace a certain volume of electrolyte and this volume that is displaced can actually be measured as a voltage pulse. So the instrument measures not the size but actually the volume of the particle and from that of course by making assumptions regarding the shape of the particle you can extract the diameter of the particle for example. The quantity of the suspension drawn through this aperture must be precisely controlled because here it is very important to um, use the same exact reproducible volume each time. The advantage of this method is that several thousand particles per second can be individually counted and sized and the method is independent of particle shape, color or density. Of course that is also the limitation of the method. You know it is very difficult when you have a sample containing many different particles of various colors, shapes and densities. It is difficult to rely on a simple Coulter counter measurement to, ass to assign a size to every one of these particles because we know that some of these interdependencies are being neglected in this measurement. But as long as you have again a very stable, very consistent sample that you are always examining and you know that the distribution of materials in the sample is not very broad, this method can be successfully used. Now photon correlation spectroscopy is actually only another name for DLS, uh, the uh, um, dynamic laser diffraction based methodology. Here what you are really doing is determining the rate of diffusion or the diffusion coefficient of the particles. Some of the advantages of this technique are that it is non-invasive, it is absolute in the sense that it does measure the diffusion rate of the particle which should in principle be related to its size. So the only assumption here is of the shape. You are assuming a spherical particle when you estimate the diffusivity based on the rate of transport of a particle. It does not require extensive sample preparation and it is actually the measure of the method of choice for size analysis of submicron particles. 
um, again what we are doing here is uh, measuring the fluctuations, the time dependent variation of scattered light and you are recording it and analyzing it to see how far particles have moved for a certain time delay. So the common property that the, the measurement um, focuses in, on is the movement. The movement of particles that arises from random thermal motion also known as Brownian diffusion. Now the detected scattering may be from individual particles or from multiple scattering in a concentrated sol solution or suspension. So like all light scattering based techniques, this requires a very dilute sample. If you have a concentrated suspension, the only method of choice really is acoustic attenuation. So the diffusion rate of the particles is determined by their size and therefore the size here is being estimated based on the rate of diffusion of the particle which is reflected in the rate of fluctuation of the scattered light. Now switching out to shape analysis, shape is a qualitative method measure unlike size which is quantitative and therefore shape analysis is always harder compared to size analysis. Now shape just like size can be obtained through projections. So you can take a three dimensional object, project it onto two dimensions on a 2D plane and obtain shape that way. So for example, you can calculate a shape index by projecting a 3D object onto a 2D plane. Here you can obviously use SEM and TEM because they are good at measuring two dimensional images and you can also automate it. Um, both SEM and TEM are available with automated measurement capability. So you can literally have thousands of three dimensional particles in the nano size range, leave the, the sample overnight and by the time you come back in the morning, you, you will have a shape distribution analysis for the entire population of particles. The only limitation is you are not going to get 3D information. What you are going to get is a two dimensional projection of the 3D particle. On the other hand, if you really want to get 3D image, there are now instruments available to be able to do that. Um, the SEM and TEM are now available in modified versions to obtain 3D morphologies. Uh, scanning probe microscopy, which we have talked about earlier, is another method that can measure vertical distances accurately. So it can add the third dimension to your measurement. And of course, uh, the atomic force microscope is um, well suited to measuring the third dimension as well. Now shape is usually assessed by taking one or two characteristic sizes and either using the absolute sizes or by using a certain ratio. So using the particle diameter ratio, you can assign a size or you can take the degree of flatness, degree of elongation, it's also known as aspect ratio, sphericity. These are all parameters that we have listed earlier when we were discussing shape characterization of particles. Again, when you, when you try to assess the shape of nanoparticles, some of these techniques may just not work because they require a very high degree of resolution. Um, so for example, flatness may be not too difficult to assess for a micron size particle, but for a nanometer size particle, the resolution that it calls for is probably beyond the limit of many of our commercially available instruments. So we have to be prepared to assess shape of nanoparticles by methods that are somewhat different from methods that are used to assess the shape of larger particles. For example, fractal dimensions. You can actually analyze the perimeter of the particle and do Fourier analysis to extract the uh, common features and you can actually ass assign a fractal dimension to the particle by using that technique. The method of density measurement on the other hand is something that is done in three different ways. You can assess material density, you can assess particle density or you can assess bulk density. Now the difference between these definitions is material de density is defined as the mass of the powder divided by the volume occupied by the solid powder after you remove internal voids. So it's also known as true density. Particle density on the other hand is simply the mass of the powder 
divided by volume occupied by the particles including the internal closed voids. So, this would equal what is known as true density only when there are no closed voids. So, in order to obtain particle density, you really do not have to do anything. You just take the sample as is and characterize it for density. However, to obtain its true density, you have to take some steps to remove voids. Now, typically that can be done either by um, applying pressure to compress the sample, by applying vacuum or even uh, temperature can be used to remove voids from a, from a material. But you certainly have to take a few steps to convert the powder into one that has no internal voids in order to be able to measure the material density. Bulk density on the other hand is really a more a, a reflection of how the powder settles when you place it in a container. So, it is of particular relevance to industry where powders are being stored or packaged or shipped. So, this is defined as the mass of powder divided by the volume of space below the upper surface of the powder when it is placed in a container. And here as we have seen before, you can talk about an initial bulk density where well dispersed particles are gently placed in a container or a tap density which is the density you measure after you have placed the powder in the container, but then you take the container and vibrate it or lift it and drop it many times or hammer it, tap it. And the ratio between the tap density and the initial density is, is defined as the Hausner ratio. And it is a, a good measure of powder flowability and compressibility. Problem is again this is a method that is particularly suited for large particles. The Hausner method of measuring the, the ratio between the tap density and the initial density will not be very accurate for nanoparticles. Other physical properties of nanoparticles that are of interest to us are melting point. Now, it is a fact that the melting point of many metals is, is lowered as you reduce them to nano sizes. For example, melting point of gold is less compared to um, bulk gold by 200 Kelvin when you reduce size to 6 nanometers. So, obviously for people that are trying to work with gold, this is fantastic. So, if you can make gold particles the nano dimensions, you can actually work with them virtually at room temperatures. You do not have to heat them to very high temperatures. So, even for simple things like making jewelry, if you can actually convert the gold to a nano form, the, um, your, your workability increases quite a bit. And the reason for that is that the reason actually is the same for all the other enhancements we see for nanoparticles. The percentage of atoms on the surface is much higher in a nanoparticle compared to the percentage of atoms in the core of the particle. It is a simple volumetric effect. You are essentially taking the same volume of material and you are packing it into a much larger surface area when you go to nano dimensions. Increase in surface area implies that the, that the subsurface and the core areas are reduced. So, that is a consequence we do not normally think about. You know, we all know that nanoparticles have high surface area, but what that means is that there is less area now contained in the interior of the particle and relatively more area on the, on the exterior of the particle. And that has several implications including the fact that melting points are lower. If you look at surface tension and wettability compared to larger particles, the contact angles of all liquid metals will decrease at 40 nanometers and less dimensions. And when you get to 10 nanometers, there is a huge decrease in the contact angle. Now, what does that mean? A decrease in contact angle means more wettable, right? So, again it is a reflection of the greater reactivity of a nanoparticle. A nanoparticle is just more open to interaction with its environment. A surrounding liquid or fluid can wet a nanoparticle much more effectively than it can wet a, a particle of larger dimensions. Of course, the specific surface area effect is one we all know about. Nanoparticles have large specific surface areas and their properties are dominated by the surface. That again is a key difference between a nanoparticle and a particle of larger dimensions. When we talk about the structure of a nanoparticle, 
again we have to look at it in three different ways. Typically a system involving nanoparticles can be classified as having a nanoparticle structure, an agglomerate structure and a composite structure. The nanoparticle structure re simply reflects how the particle itself looks, the core, internal dispersions, the hollowness of the particle, the porosity in the particle. The agglomerate structure reflects in addition to those the agglomeration of adjacent particles. And finally, the composite material involves the nanomaterial as well as the substance that it is actually uh, dispersed in. So when we talk about structure in a nanoparticle system, it's not unique. You have, to, you have to be careful about are you talking about the structure of the nanoparticle itself or the structure of the agglomerate or the structure of the composite system. The three are completely different. So dispersibility, cohesiveness, porosity and compact density are the basic properties of composite structures. And in order to characterize nanoparticle composites, you have to be able to characterize each one of these. The microstructure of uh, these structures can be evaluated using techniques such as SEMTEM combined with EDS, WS. Sample preparation has to be done very carefully when you approach the nano dimensions. Grain analysis requires the use of AFM. If you are talking about a nanoparticle, you have grain sizes that are sub nano. AFM is the only technique that has the sensitivity and resolution to be able to measure in those dimensions. The crystal structure, again, uh, typically the structure does not necessarily change when we go to larger particles. You know, starting from a bulk material, when you go to larger particle sizes, the crystal structure remains the same. However, for nanoparticles, the crystal structure can become dependent on the size of the particle, thermodynamic effects such as the stability of the structure, quantum effects as well as size effects. All of this is dependent not only on the, the internal structure of the particle but also the exterior environment. So with a nanoparticle, you can actually, because they have such a high surface area and so much reactivity with the external ambient environment, you can even influence its crystal structure by suitably altering the external conditions. Other surface characteristics of nanoparticles are quantum size effects, adhesion, coagulation. This we have discussed in more detail earlier. Surface relaxation and stabilization. A nanoparticle is in a more, in a, in a state of equilibrium compared to larger sized particles. It is closer to a state of equilibrium and therefore it displays lower surface free energy. Now what that means is you have a more stable system. So by going to nano dimensions, typically you can achieve systems that display greater physical stability as well as chemical stability compared to systems comprising of larger particles. Chemical reactions are accelerated at nano scale, specific adsorption is higher and equilibrium is reached faster once again because reactivity is much greater at the nano dimension. Of course many mechanical properties are also um, altered as you approach nano dimensions. The strength of metals and ceramics improves by decreasing the grain size to the nano size and making nano composites. However in metals yield strength interestingly first increases with decrease in grain size but eventually it starts to decrease. Mechanical properties of bulk powders as well as individual particles vary with particle size. The strength of the alumina particle changes as size changes, E modulus changes, um, Young's modulus can be changed by changing size and the reason that carbon nanotubes have excellent mechanical properties is mainly because the cylindrical structure of the graphene sheets is very stable. So it's a stability that really gives it the strength. Electrical properties, again for large particles, they tend to be same as for bulk material. For nanoparticles, they are very likely to be very different, but they are also hard to measure. There is a new method which involves the solving of the phonon equation of motion in a time varying electric field. 
where essentially if you know the size, you can calculate the dielectric constant or if you know the dielectric constant, you can cal calculate the size that has enabled us now to start measuring the properties of nano sized particles, the electrical properties of nano sized particles. You see a significant enhancement around 15 to 20 nanometer of particle size. Again, magnetism is uh, a property that changes with dimension. Feeble magnetism is enhanced as size decreases. However, antiferromagnetism is not so greatly influenced by size. Ferromagnetism is again uh, affected by size reduction. And finally, nano sized magnetic materials, while they may be more magnetic in nature, I mean the magnetic intensity may be higher, they are also more unstable. So it is difficult to make a nano sized magnetic material and hope to obtain stable properties. Typically this is addressed by adding surface coatings that, that um, sustains the, the magnetic effect over a longer period of time. Optical properties as we have seen, they certainly change with particle size. Um, the optical behavior of nanoparticles will depend on whether it is an insulating particle, semiconducting or conducting particles. Nanoparticles on their own do not emit light very much. Again, light emission is a surface area dependent property. So as particles become smaller, the emission of light decreases just as scattering decreases. One of the key things to remember is if the wavelength of the incident light is larger than the particle size that you are trying to measure, you are not going to be able to measure the single particle. You are actually going to be measuring groups or clusters of particles. So the wavelength of incident light has to be matched to the size of the particle you are trying to measure. It must be kept significantly smaller than the size of the object. Luminescence measurements are very effective for nanoparticles because of their chemical reactivity. They are easily excited by light rays or electron rays. So you can do spectral analysis of sample luminescence to obtain information about the size, shape as well as composition of nanoparticles. In general, because of the small dimension of nanoparticles, single measurements are not sufficient and you have to rely on statistical measurements. So to summarize, nanotechnology is a fast growing discipline as we all know. And if you want to really play in this field, we have to understand the basics of nanoparticles. Understand that many properties of materials are different at nanoscale. This certainly presents an opportunity, but there is also an enhanced risk factor. We have already seen some harmful consequences of uh, nano products that are being commercially made. Um, the nano materials can penetrate skin very easily. So the human hygiene effects of nanoparticles are still being debated. Same thing with uh, nano fertilizers. While we are certainly seeing an enrichment of material in the soil, it is also quite possible that these nano additives are passed up the food chain and humans wind up ingesting these nanoparticles, which can again lead to cancer and, and other problems. So the opportunities and risks associated with nanomaterials have to be better understood as well. Synthesis in large scale of nanoparticles remains a challenge. The bottom up approaches especially do not lend themselves to scaling for larger quantities. So there is a lot of opportunity here. And finally, nanoparticle characterization is a crucial aspect of all this because as Lord Kelvin once said, you cannot control what you do not measure. So if you do not have the ability to characterize nanoparticles both qualitatively and quantitatively, you are never going to be sure what you get. Uh, the, the variations in product quality, quantity, all of this you have to be able to measure and address. And so in order to do that, you have to be aware of various techniques of particle characterization and be able to apply them as needed. So that concludes our discussion of particle characterization as it applies to nanotechnology. In the next lecture, we will discuss a little bit about nanofluids, which is another interesting application where nanoparticles are being used to enhance conductivity of various fluids and we will look at what specific characteristics of nanoparticles play the most significant role in enhancing the properties of, uh, of nanofluids. Um, any question on what we have covered today? <laughs>
Okay, see you at the next lecture then.